Thank you very much. As people who have seen the paper uh, will have noticed, this is a paper written out of memory, not out of research. Paper written out of research would have taken uh, a few more years and then end up as a minor venturi, something <laughs> this big. But uh, I don't think I have the age to do that either. So I just went on and uh, fished out pieces that I had collected in my memory over the years, and it shows. It's very anecdotal, completely anecdotal, totally impressionistic, and it also has another terrible defiance that I missed out a very important paper written by my, this is a case of total misfortune, by my commentator. The only excuse is that, as he says, the journal where he published it disappeared <laughs> not long after he had written the paper, and so I was justified in not finding it in, well, in catalogs and uh, references and things like that. But uh, let's just get on. What I uh, could not miss, although it was <laughs> out of the, there were two, the two bits that start the paper, are episodes and quotations that are, that are before 1861. But they are so nice, as it were, <laughs> that I couldn't miss them. First of all, the uh, definition of natural and unnatural development by Adam Smith, on which most of, uh, well, development theory, growth theory, and capital theory is based. And that was written in reference, with reference, to the mode of development of the Anza countries and of the Italian republics. And uh, he has uh, this uh, couple of sentences that I reproduced in which the unnatural mode of development is, of course, our own <laughs> mode of development, in which rather than starting from agriculture and going on, with savings uh, piled back into industry. You do have uh, money coming from uh, trade, and your traders uh, plow the, the waters rather than the uh, earth, the soil, bring back the riches, sometimes under the form of plunder. If you remember, that is the most beautiful, pretty, the prettiest example given by uh, Keynes in uh, his uh, theory of money, uh, book in the second uh, volume, he is <laughs> discounting the value of what Francis Drake brought back as a case of primitive accumulation for Britain. And then if you do, uh, do the appropriate <laughs> accounts, you find that the whole wealth of the UK at the time of the empire is based on the plunder by <laughs> Francis Drake. Very much tongue-in-cheek, but a great tongue-in-cheek. Unfortunately, it doesn't deal with Italy. I did not put in uh, for uh, Amor di Patria <laughs> the letters that Keynes wrote when he was at the Secretary at the Treasury in the First World War about Italy. And the Italians, you know, he was giving out uh, loans and uh, uh, apportioning the uh, uh, various uh, commodities that were needed by the Allies. And he couldn't understand how the Italians went to him asking for more and more wheat, more and more wheat, whole ships of wheat. Said, what do they do with this wheat? This are, it's got the same approach as the usual things. These Italians are tricking us. <laughs> but it wasn't. He had just misunderstood what the diet was. The diet was wheat, bread, pasta, and nothing else. And these people, the soldiers, a couple of millions of them, it was the first time they were eating in their lives. In fact, their health, the ones who weren't killed, improved no end because of the good diet of the Italian army. And so he, they were telling the truth. And in fact, 
after the Second World War, we were rescued by the famous Liberty ships from Argentina, loaded with uh, wheat. If you go to Argentina and you find the relevant generation, before you start, start the stop today, they will tell you how they rescued Italy with uh, loads, ship loads of wheat. But we gave them back one billion euros per annum since 1991, we're still paying under the form of unearned pensions. It's a very interesting episode of giving back, which we gave back many shiploads. We're still giving them every year one billion euros of shiploads, <laughs> as if it were. But I didn't put these things in for Carita di Patria. Now, the other, uh, all the chapters deal with one subject and uh, uh, they are usually linked to one particular writer among the foreigners who wrote about Italy, of course. And uh, the uh, episode in which, uh, after Adam Smith, I deal with what John uh, wrote about is the famous episode of the sulfur war between the UK and the Kingdom of Naples in the end of the, 19, of the 1830s. And they reproduce it there in the paper because of the beauty of the mix, which is typical, of when not only you are an imperialist, but you're also somebody who is teaching these poor people whom you're imperialized over, <laughs> that they are wrong, theoretically wrong. They apply wrong theories. They're a bunch of savages who don't know what they should be knowing. And so Lord Palmerston's letters to the King of Naples are about not only you are treating, doing, um, establishing a monopoly over something on which you have no right to establish a monopoly, that is sulfur in Sicily, but also, you are wrong from the point of view of political economy. This modern political economy says you are wrong. So, after that, the king replies, saying, if you want to send these ships, then you are right. You know, gunboat diplomacy works. You have more ships than we do. And Palmerston had started by putting the ships in, by asking the, the British fleet to plow the seas, and if they found a Neapolitan uh, merchant, he would uh, sequester it, uh, just uh, <laughs> tie it to, to a rope and bring it into Malta. But also, the king says, however, you cannot give us lessons in political economy because we are the country <laughs> of Galliani, Genovesi, and Brogia. All of them lived before he doesn't say Adam Smith, but the best of uh, your economies. So let us deal. You are stronger, we are weaker, but not talk about political economy because we don't teach, we don't get lessons in that field. So that is a case which I only reproduce because it, it's beautiful from the point of view of an economist to see how these theories can be applied by politicians. And then uh, uh, the uh, choice between protection and free trade. And after the episode of the, might be a, a case, but after the episode of the Neapolitan, of the Sicilian sulfur, uh, then uh, the Neapolitans became the so-called scourge of Europe. That was 1850, but definitely the other states of Italy learned the lesson, not of political economy, but of applied economics, and uh, did not resort to protection. Well, John says this was the policy everybody was adopting because of the supremacy of British industry at the time. So the others were defending themselves. In Italy, you find that uh, Rather than fighting them, uh, Cavour chooses to join them. And uh, the same thing uh, is done by his followers. Now, Werner Zombert, who is another gentleman people should read but don't read anymore, in his uh, beautiful 
uh, pages on the Italian commercial policy, uh, says that, uh, since he is obviously an admirer of Cavour, that had he lived, he would have not applied the policy of free trade to a big kingdom, because he knew that for a small place like Piedmont it might work. But for a big kingdom, as he had then, uh, managed to uh, assemble, there would be another policy needed. But uh, this was not to be, he died, and his followers uh, applied. First of all, Adam Smith. Uh, they chose agriculture, also because the elites were landowners and then uh, free trade, and then an overvalued currency. Now this morning we have heard that the Italian currency from 1860 uh, was uh, undervalued. But in my own research I have uh, found that it was not overvalued vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, because as I said, that is not the relevant uh, currency to use for that period, but they were overvalued and they were overvalued vis-a-vis -vis the uh, relevant currencies, the currencies of the main countries of Europe with which they competed, or against which they competed. But if you read Werner Zombert, he has a very beautiful approach to growth. Says the Italian start this process of growth industrialization because they, of their willpower, not because of economics. The economics of it is not present at the time. The others have it, we want it. And that's good enough, he says. It's a good explanation of people's psychologies. You play, you have ships, we love ships. You have aeroplanes, we love aeroplanes. And it's not, uh, he's not pretending the whole thing is economically rational, but he says, if you do the natural development growth model, use that, then you can only have natural industries, what he calls natural industries. That is to say the ones determined by the geography and by endowment, resource endowment. And we don't want that, because with that you're exposed to all the vagaries of the international cycle. Then you are uh, industrializing to beat the vagaries of the international cycle. So that's another beautiful paper that should be uh, read. Uh, I think even today, because he has uh, visits the Terni steelworks and uh, shows, so this thing shows that the Italians can make big industry if they want to, big plants, very efficient plants. Uh, state-of-the-art plans. Well, he says, when Italy started, there was no place in Italy that could be called industrialized. Yes, there were industries, but the factory system, he says, was not really present anywhere. There were a few exceptions, but uh, it is not. Uh, and then they went on, and he revised the, 19, the 1880s. And that, for economic historians, is very important. It was the quarrel between Gershon Grown, uh, Romeo, and the Marxists was uh, uh, also about the 1880s, uh, because uh, obviously Gershon Grown didn't uh, really put much weight on the effort that had been made by Italian industry in the 1880s. And on the other hand, uh, uh, Zombart, he didn't know the thing that went afterwards because it's not taken place yet, but uh, he was uh, uh, impressed by what had gone on in the 1880s in the field of industry. But my own uh, discovery, something I had not read and I read for the purpose of this paper, is Bonifon Crapon. Well, von Grappan, uh, we all know because uh, the second bit of his name <laughs> means idiot, testone, but in Italian, of course, not in French. But uh, I always uh, had read about this book and I never actually read it, so I borrowed it from the 
library and read it. And it's a fantastic book. It should really be read by students in uh, this anniversary of the Italian unification. Because the man was, uh, first of all, a learned person who had uh, studied at the, uh, what they call uh, uh, the commerce of Paris. And he was a grand, therefore, to become a grand commis, as he did become after he became an industrialist because his uh, uh, padrino was uh, an industrialist, a silk trader in Italy. So he came to Italy and became a silk trader. And being a foreigner, he was appointed to be the first head of the Unione Industriale di Torino and then the first head of Confindustria. So this is a rare occasion of a man who is explaining in this book, L'Italy au Travail, which is written in 19, published in 1916 in Paris, writing for his own uh, countrymen, about a country he knows best and he loves, obviously, but with a mix of uh, learning, you know, being at the, the French uh, Grand Ecolier, with a full uh, knowledge of uh, Italian industry because he's been a practitioner in uh, fields as diverse as silk and automobiles, both in Torino, around there. And uh, he therefore has a way of presenting things which is extremely lively and which is extremely knowledgeable of a knowledge which usually people who write these sort of books don't have. There are usually economists, journalists, uh, historians, but they're not industrialists and learned industrialists. And he has some uh, remarks uh, which I have uh, put in the paper about the Italian capitalists, the Italian workers, the difference between North and South, the uh, one particular sector, two particular sectors, which are silk and especially automobiles. For instance, if you want to understand what went on in Torino when the automobile industry was uh, founded and throve, uh, that chapter is fantastic because it tells you this is a, a country and a town which have been able to uh, compete state of the art in no time. They just started the thing which became internationally viable immediately with no money from the government, nothing. How did they do it? And it tells you how they did it. They also has an interview with Giovanni Agnelli Sr. where he's obviously in a great admiration of this man and uh, reasonably. And he tells you that the man is making, has been making luxury cars, which has been exporting to the United States. Cars that cost three times as much as a Ford. They were extremely successful. Then, after the bubble in the US deflated, we had to rescue. The first rescue of Fiat took place exactly then. But uh, the man thinks that he would like to have also the average, you know, the small cars. But that is going to be much more difficult, much more difficult. And that's going to be the tragedy of Viet all these decades. The incomes don't match the cars. <laughs> we don't have the money to buy them for a very long time. And if you find it all in Bonnefon, crap on. So I dedicated a chapter to him. Then I also had a violon d'angre, something I have read a long time ago, which is the country study uh, that the Economic Cooperation Administration uh, dedicated to Italy in 19, uh, early 1949, and which has been a bone of contention for Italian uh, economists and economic historians and politicians since it appeared. Now, it is uh, considered this uh, uh, paper, this report, a case of, uh, as it were, uh, innocent Keynesianism. <laughs> I think it's a very Keynesian, but very sophisticated Keynesian, 
and it is a political paper. It says, uh, we're giving you this money because we have to fight communism. Fighting communism means uh, eradicating unemployment. You have a glaring case of Keynesian unemployment in the north of Italy. You also have disguised unemployment in agriculture, but the most dangerous bit is the uh, uh, Keynesian unemployment in the north of Italy, where industry has not been created after the war. It existed before. And, uh, you know, they couldn't use Vera Zamani's <laughs> figures for industrialization in the northern regions, but uh, they knew about it, what had been told about it. So they knew what the situation was, and they thought that deflation protected was a very good thing to eradicate inflation. He, uh, they, these young Americans who wrote the report, were very much impressed by it. They said, no, no, you please stop it. <laughs> Don't go on doing too much, because otherwise, you will not uh, yield, earn all the uh, benefits from your own policy. Now, the interesting thing is that what they uh, suggest is not public works, but public investment, saying, look, if we wait for the Italian industries to invest, they won't invest because they are not certain that the communist threat is gone away. So before they invest, this country is going to be a long time. Therefore, since we have this beautiful thing called IRI, then why don't you put it to be at the center of the development process? And they will invest in uh, heavy industry, because they are the only ones who can do it. And they are to be the core of the development uh, effort. What happened was exactly what they said. The recipe was their own recipe. First of all, for the mechanical industry, the engineering industry, they had uh, uh, a special series of uh, Il Fondo Industria Meccanica, which was uh, a way of looking after this problem of unemployment there, sectoral unemployment. And then uh, holding the IRI was put at the center of the development effort. And they went about it with public investment and infrastructures. If you read Eichen Green's textbook, you know, published two or three years ago, you will find that he differentiates between uh, the Italian miracle and the German miracle. The, Italian, the German miracle is experts, experts, and experts. The Italian miracle is public investment, public investment, and public investment. And in both cases, it worked. So these poor young people, <laughs> one of them I uh, note was Richard Bessel, who then unfortunately became the designer of the Bay of Pigs disaster. <laughs> so <laughs> his future was not as good as his beginning. I actually met him in Washington many years ago. He was, uh, <laughs> he had become very different from the Richard Bissell of the European Cooperation Administration. Now then I go on to uh, the uh, Dreyer tribe of Gershengron versus the others. And uh, I noticed there that uh, the chapter which occupies Vera Lutz rather than Gershon Gran, is uh, the position which has prevailed uh, from the point of view of propaganda in all the decades after, saying the, the problem is the unions in the North. The unions are the ones that stand uh, between Italy and proper development. If we more or less abolish them, <laughs> tell them off, then there will be a normal case of European development for Italy. Otherwise, uh, no, otherwise it will be stunted in various ways. Of course, for all the Luigi Spavet, Luigi Basinetti, Gardner, Nacli, all uh, assembled to tell Vera Luz that she was wrong and why she was wrong. 
and they say it in the paper, but uh, the message that this woman uh, portray, uh, sent out was the one that stuck. And in fact, if you go anywhere and you ask the proper people, they will tell you that it is the unions. So, then uh, I have just a few sketches, and uh, the time is over, so sketches are small is beautiful. The whole, <laughs> Uh, the whole idea is one of the very few Italian ideas in economics. Of course, it's Marshall, but you know, Marshall re reapplied. And then uh, it's propagandized by Chuck Sable and uh, uh, Fiore, Michael Fiore. And then it becomes uh, extremely popular with even uh, people like Putnam writing new versions of Banfield's uh, a moral Mediterranean familism and other folklore uh, ways of telling what happened in Italy. But then I start with Abulafia, and Abulafia tells the story of the two Italies starting in uh, <laughs> much earlier in the Italian, uh, in, in the Italy of Boccaccio and the Angevins and so on. But I say, look, uh, there are even uh, older, older versions of this. For instance, Toimbi thought that Calabria had been devastated by the Romans for having sided with Hannibal and never recovered. <laughs> so it's an older story. Well, then I say the new Italian decline has not attracted many observers from abroad yet. And I conclude with a sentence in which I say that it will be a long time before a Chinese Ruskin will uh, stand in front of the ruins of a Prato textile works and warn his own countrymen who have been successful to look you can go the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Marcello. Uh, and John Davis is at this council. John. John. Well, let me start by thanking Marcello De Cecco. I always enjoy reading his work and uh, the paper that he's uh, summarized for us uh, this, uh, this morning is, I think, in many ways, quintessentially de Cecchiano, if that word exists. Uh, in a handful of vignettes, he brilliantly addresses the reasons why and the preoccupations with which foreign observers and economists have sought to make sense of what seemed to be the constant enigmas of Italy's economic growth across a period that moves from the years before unification uh, to the present. Um, as he said himself at the, uh, at the start of his, uh, his presentation, uh, he's attempted uh, something very similar to uh, what Franco Venturi uh, did in that volume of the uh, Storia d'Italia published by Einaudi. Uh, the only difference being was that Venturi's essay took most of a volume and uh, Marcello manages to get his comments into 15 closely typed uh, pages. Um, so, um, in those uh, vignettes, um, he shows how, over the, uh, the centuries, Italy has provided uh, a range of economic uh, questions that have engaged and fascinated um, outside uh, observers. Uh, in fact, his, uh, his comments immediately brought to mind um, comments by, in a recent publication by Vera Zamani and Paolo Melanima, uh, which I'm going to quote because uh, uh, they, they point to uh, the, same, the same issues. Um, uh, Melanima and Zamani say that, the, the, and this was um, uh, a publication two years ago, the Italian case of economic growth is in many ways atypical. The interpretation of Italian economic history defeats conventional wisdom, requires caution and openness to much more than standard economics. This is why the Italian economy 
uh, has often been likened to a bumblebee, which in theory should not be able to fly. The explanation of why it does fly can only come from approaches that do not separate the economy from society and which look to a very long term as a horizon. Well, uh, one of the first uh, people to notice this, as Marcello has uh, told us, was, uh, uh, was, was, was Adam Smith. Um, and in the successive snapshots uh, that he develops, uh, he shows how at different points Italy has provided foreign observers with opportunities to test, above all, I think, theoretical controversies. In the late 19th century between the advocates of free trade and protectionism, after the Great War, uh, in particular on the role of the state in the economy, after the Second World War, rival Keynesian neoclassical formulae for economic recovery and growth in Europe, uh, and then finally the roots and significance of the expansion of the so-called Third Italy in the 1980s. His subtext, it seems to me, is, is implicit, uh, but I think clear. Uh, in each of these periods, when growth came, it was generally for reasons that foreign observers had failed to identify. Hence, uh, foreign perspectives on the Italian economy have over time tended to be mercurial and to swing, um, perhaps rather uncritically at times, between tales of abject failure uh, and stories of miraculous successes. Um, now, the focus of this vignette is, um, I think, sort of moves down to focus particularly on those uh, foreign economic analyses, observations um, that were particularly uh, effective in the sense that they found some response. And I, I think it's particularly in his analysis of the ways in which the often rather bizarre, contradictory ways in which these response mechanisms work, uh, that one of the great richnesses of his paper uh, lies. Um, it's certainly a paper that is full of insights, not least because uh, his success in choosing uh, both individuals and events that uh, do not figure very prominently in standard economic history uh, textbooks of, uh, of Italy. Um, and since it's something on which I've written myself, I was certainly very pleased to, uh, uh, to see the extended reference to what at the time had the wonderful title of the affair of the Sicilian brimstones, uh, the Sicilian sulfur uh, crisis of the 1840s, which very nearly resulted in open war between Great Britain and, um, and the Bourbon Kingdom of Naples, and as a result of which, uh, as Marcello has said, the Bourbons were actually forced to abandon a protectionist policy uh, on which they had attempted to create a domestic industrial base, build up a merchant navy, build up a uh, marina militare, uh, none of which uh, was um, uh, likely to endear them uh, to the eyes of any British government and certainly not to that of a government of, of Lord Palmerston. Uh, hence the encounter, which in a way is, I think, one of the critical turning points in the economic history, political history, too, of the Risorgimento. Um, something very similar happened in 1857 after the Pisacani affair, when again the Bourbons were humiliated, forced to uh, hand over the, um, uh, the Piroscaf or the, the Cagliari, which they had quite legitimately uh, taken because it was involved in piracy, but um, that was not how it was, it was understood. But the counterpart, uh, the, the, the other side of, of that southern uh, story is, I think, um, as uh, Marcello has, has already said, the fervent commitment on the part of Cavour uh, to the policies of, of free trade. And there is a sort of dramatic illustration of that contrast in the fact that in 1852, if I remember correctly, the Rothschild Bank closed down its agency in Naples on the grounds that there was no 
business left to keep them there. And at the same time, not only were Cavour's reforms taking off in, in Piedmont, but uh, British and French capital was beginning to flow rapidly into Piedmont. And who was invited to Turin uh, in 1851 to advise uh, the, uh, the young Cavour, uh, but William Nassau Sr. So there is a, a, a very nice uh, contrast. Uh, as a subtext to that, uh, that story. Now, after unification, um, it's clear that foreign interest in the Italian economy and its performance uh, remained, uh, remained high. Um, the particular case of Italy, the issue of protectionism versus free trade, I think, um, was really just part of a much broader European uh, debate on, on the rival virtues of free trade or possibilities of free trade and protectionism at that, uh, that time. Uh, but it was certainly uh, accompanied by increasing inflows of foreign capital, uh, although that was changing in composition. And the citations of, of uh, Werner Sombart and Louis Bonfant uh, Crapone uh, remind us of the importance pre-1915 of the presence of both German and French capital uh, in uh, Italy. Uh, reading um, Marcello's comments on Sombart and, and uh, Bonfant Crapone, um, I couldn't help thinking of um, Deformazione di origine of two, two uh, English observers um, a little bit earlier, um, Bolton King and Thomas Oakey, who in 1901 published uh, what I think is, is, is still a, a, a book well worth reading, Italy Today. Um, the, part, the, the important part was written by Bolton King, who was already well known as a historian. He wrote the first English language history of Italian unification, very, very keen, uh, very well informed follower of Italian events. Um, and uh, it contains, the, their book contains one quotation which I can't resist um, reading uh, now because it does seem to have a very contemporary relevance, immediate, although it doesn't perhaps quite square with what we heard about the Italian national debt in the Jolitian period earlier this morning. But in their 1901 book, uh, Bolton King wrote, the financial question is at the bottom of half of the difficulty in Italy today, 1901. The country is weighed down by taxation because the state has undertaken burdens beyond its strength. There is no money where money is urgently needed for education, for agriculture and industrial development because the resources of the country are already uh, hypothecated, mortgaged. Um, Yet, despite their concerns about the level of debt and the level, resulting levels of uh, taxation, and this is something that uh, Gianni Tognolo and, and uh, Patrick O'Brien, if I remember correctly, have written a paper on too. Um, despite their concerns, um, Bolton King's um, assessment of Italy's economic future in 1901 uh, was not only very optimistic, but it actually anticipates many of the themes that have been picked up much more recently in uh, the revisionist uh, historiography of uh, the economics of liberal uh, Italy. They wrote, uh, it seems probable that Italy will soon become a very considerable competitor in the international markets for all kinds of yarns and textiles, electrical machinery, motor engines and boilers, perhaps also in chemicals and furniture. Her rivers will do for her much of what coal has done for England, and her, her artisans bid fair to be the equal of any. Geography, they went on to say, endowed the peninsula with great advantages of the international commercial trading nation. Um, and their conclusion was that all that needed to be done in 1901 was for the government to reduce taxation, lower transportation costs, particularly for railways, and uh, attract, attract uh, more foreign capital investment. Now, there is a straight link with um, Louis Bonfant Craponi, because he was also a great admirer of 
Italian labor. Now, this is a little strange because, as Marcello uh, remarked, um, Craponi was one of the founders of the Turian Unione Industriale, and he was one of the most aggressive leaders of the Turian industrialists. Uh, in their struggles with the, uh, uh, with the labor movement uh, before 1915. Um, in fact, Giolitti wanted to uh, send him back to France, get him out of the way because he saw him as a provocation, uh, something that um, uh, Giovanni Agnelli agreed with. In fact, Agnelli broke with him. But in his uh, Italio Travail, uh, written in 1916, Craponi lavished praise on the Italian industrial workers uh, whom he considered to be much better than their French counterparts. Uh, industrial ventures here, he wrote, reveal a wonderful asset, the Italian worker. At the outset, this is a somewhat rough and primitive instrument, but once one that is extremely straightforward and very economical. The Italian worker is not only intelligent and clever, but he is sober, absinthe, is quite unknown in uh, Italy. Now, going back for a moment to, uh, to Bolton King, um, one of the arguments that Marcello has developed is that uh, foreign observers were drawn to Italy less by an understanding of the Italian economy than by a desire to test their own particular economic theories and ideologies. Uh, that's true, I think, of Sombart and Crepone, but I'm not sure it's entirely true of King. Um, he was uh, a passionate advocate of uh, rural cooperatives, and I think to, to understand where he was coming from, he, he, we have to remember too that, that his great model was Mazzini, and Mazzini's republicanism, Mazzini's notion of association, uh, and that was what led him to this very optimistic account of the cooperative uh, movement in, uh, in Italy at the turn of the century. And I think there's an interesting continuity forward here because those ideas uh, sort of move forward through the English Fabian movement uh, into the British labor movement and they're very much the ideas that Carlo Rosselli uh, came into contact with after the First World War and um, before his, his first visits to, uh, to England. Uh, and through Rosselli, uh, I think uh, there is a sort of tenuous but visible uh, thread that leads back into the uh, political economy of Justitia e Libertà uh, and uh, the post-war, post-Second War uh, Italian Republican uh, movement. Um, okay, I'm just going to jump forward. I don't want to leave out uh, Vera Lutz and the, uh, but the, the, I mean the, 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 the contrast that uh, Marcello has drawn, I think, between um, the country study on uh, Italy after the Second World War, Keynesian assumptions that it was based on, which were initially uh, rejected outright by the Italian economic and financial authorities, uh, but then wholeheartedly adopted and implemented on one hand. And again, the example of Vera Lutz is anti-Keynesian uh, uh, arguments, uh, which were initially greeted with horror uh, and uh, total rejection, but then in large part adopted and fully implemented, is an absolutely wonderful um, uh, demonstration of the complexities of the process of assimilation and, and uh, uh, of, of um, uh, economic advice, let's say, coming from outside. On the question of the third Italy, there is, I think, uh, a, a, another, um, um, there's another element to take account of in explaining the enthusiasm of foreign um, responses to an interest in small is beautiful. And part of it is, is, is contemporary, and uh, Marcello has certainly pointed to, uh, to those sources. But um, I think we can also go back a little, a little further because uh, there's been discussion of, of Adam Smith, of Ricardo, but Sismondi, going back to the 19th century, 
has become very fashionable of late. Everyone talks about Sismondi, so I think we should talk about Sismondi. And what makes Sismondi relevant here, of course, is not only the rediscovery of the political uh, model of the early uh, Italian city-states, but also Sismondi's vigorous defense of the Tuscan sharecropping contract, the Mezzadria. And that really establishes a line of discussion which obviously occupies much of the attention of the Tuscan gentry and the Tuscan academies for the 19th century, but it went much further. And we can find there are very, I mean, there's a, a very interesting study that should be written on the uh, way in which the Mezzadria is used in the United States in the late 19th century in the discussions about homesteading. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the homesteading uh, project. And I think that if we were to go back, we'd find a sort of a filone of a sort of s almost a utopian search for alternatives to um, large-scale capitalist uh, economic development and, uh, and so on, which resurfaces in the debates on the, uh, on the Third Italy, but as I say, has a, has a prehistory that I think could be traced back to, to, uh, to Sismondi. So, um, final concluding point, point um, is that um, as we approach the, as we move now to the, uh, to the present, uh, Marcello argues that um, um, once Italy uh, moved into relative economic stagnation, uh, foreigners, foreign observers have lost interest. And I really wonder whether that is the case. I immediately started thinking about the huge volume of literature that was generated barely a decade ago by the issue of the long-term decline of the United Kingdom as an industrial economy. It seems to me that economists are as much interested, and economic historians are as much interested in decline as they are in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in success. Uh, so, uh, and also, of course, uh, the British case is, is, is um, uh, is useful as a comparison because it indicates that it really takes a very long time before uh, decline becomes uh, evident. Success uh, tends to uh, trigger more immediate reactions and indeed in the case of Italy in the 1980s, Marcello has illustrated how little foreign observers uh, were prepared to see the limitations of that form of, of uh, development. Decline is, is different. So, it may be, I don't know whether it'll be a Chinese Ruskin, uh, but it may be um, another uh, Ruskin who, uh, before long, or even an economic uh, historian. But then, who knows? Um, economic uh, observers in the past haven't been very good at predict predicting uh, Italy's economic future. So it may well be that the next generation will be celebrating another round of miracles. Kisa. Thank you, John. Um, questions from the floor? Question, comments? There is one question here. I am Vera Zamani, and um, uh, yes, in fact, uh, John Davis uh, s said the thing that I wanted to say. <laughs> I want to insist upon it, you know. And is the Bonnet von Capon, which I read uh, at many years ago, uh, his book. And uh, he ended up by saying uh, that um, um, uh, the uh, industrial triangle, he didn't call it like that at the time, obviously, uh, was similar to uh, um, a development that took place in America, no? and uh, because of the, he uh, used this, uh, this word, this expression, you know, because of its uh, um, 
uh, overflowing and all fact that it was very spontaneous and not induced, as in fact uh, you, you mentioned, uh, and, and you also mentioned. And this uh, fact that he belonged to the industrialist, uh, he was, uh, uh, he praised so much trade unions, not because the stance they had, I mean, the, the views they had in terms of wages, but because uh, the people were uh, excellent uh, workers, you know, and so had to be respected in a way. But perhaps uh, uh, the, the other comment is that certainly Marcello could do much more on this, uh, because uh, um, uh, uh, I think it, is, it would be very relevant to view other uh, foreigners that came to Italy to do business, uh, for instance, the Swiss who came to, to Bergamo, no? just to make another example. Actually, the Swiss even tried to go to Naples, but like the Rothschild, they didn't have much success there. They no, stayed. Instead, in, in, um, in Bergamo, they did. And finally, maybe I can make my usual comment, and that, you know, Marcello knows because I've written it already, on uh, the country study. Uh, and uh, the people in Italy took the suggestion by the Americans of doing public investment uh, in, uh, in perhaps not in, in the right meaning that the Americans wanted to, to mean, you know, because they thought that public investment was like an Asian investment to dig holes in, in, uh, in the ground, and so they discarded it and said, no, because we want to have uh, Mm, productive investments, uh, uh, investments in, uh, in, uh, in basic uh, uh, sectors, uh, and so perhaps this is the reason why they did not want to follow, no, on, in the fear no, that it would be useless investment and not the one that they, they aimed at. Professor De Cecco, I would have liked to, um, to see something about the living condition, the living standards in Italy, what foreigners thought, because we have seen that GDP and growth not always does a good job in telling the living standards. So I wonder whether the story that is sort of told in, in the paper is also wouldn't change if um, they consider living standards in addition to GDP per capita or those kind of things. Thank you. Oh, Marcello, thank you for your... I haven't read your paper, so I don't know what you write and you say exactly on the country study, which is, it was a famous political episode. And, uh, if you connect it to the position that we are left-wing forces took at that time, but not only communists or socialists, but also, you know, some of the Christian, somebody in the Christian democracy, and uh, you know, we are very much close or closer to uh, the sort of germ, to the Keynesian outlook of the country study than to the more conservative posit, uh, policies, which were at that time followed. The point is. It's only to remember the Piano del Lavoro, to remember the CGIL, which was a very a pretty important episode, really. The first frame of, uh, uh, you know, mm, thoughtful uh, <coughs> production from the left wings uh, mm, in, the, in that time. But you remember also the position that really important economists had at that time. And they just think of Sergio, of Sergio Steve or Giorgio Fuà. Paolo Silo Stabini, which are very much. Well, can you go back at those times and tell you, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, what do you think about the really heated discussions? Well, you know, on the one side, there are people who are saying, well, the problem are really, the real Italian problems at this time are really supply side or supply problems. You know, if you really started with a big kind of uh, uh, Keynesian boom, you will come up very immediately to supply bottlenecks and you rekind on inflation, which is already a big problem to really to dampen at those times. On the other side, 
now you have uh, real Italian growth would have been more immediate and more successful had uh, uh, <coughs> you know the country study suggestion been followed. What do you think about that? Really going going back to that to that to that uh, you know big discussion around the early 50s, basically or around the 50s, okay, early 50s, late late 40s. Sorry, maybe it's all in here, but I haven't read it. Marcello, do you want to take some moment yeah, to reply? I, Sorry, they read the country study, the Italian uh, conservatives, the way you have reported. But if you read it, it doesn't say that. So they read what they wanted to read, not what it was written there. What was written there, it, first of all, is written in an extremely, as I noticed, in, as I noted in the paper, extremely modern. It looks like something written this year. And that's not true of many other documents. It's fantastic, really. Looks like Obama's advisors <laughs> say more or less the same things <laughs> as well. And then uh, everybody here read it. They said, oh yes, make uh, roads that lead nowhere. Uh, I remember a friend of mine who had written his thesis on it, telling me many years afterwards, ah, suppose we had followed the country study. We would find ourselves with a bunch of obsolete public housing third-rate public housing. What do we do with it? But they said the opposite. In fact, when I reread it, I felt very strongly about the misreading of it all. In any case, I cannot miss the opportunity to say that when I reviewed Vera's book called From the Periphery to the Center, I said, good thing she wrote it now, because if she had written in a few years, she might have called it and back. <laughs> Inevitably, it seems to have happened. Anyway, Vicky, living conditions, yes. However, it cuts both ways, because as you know, there was a lady, an English lady in Naples at the end of the 19th century, who was standing on the road to Sorrento. Now there is a little lapide inscribed to her, looking after the asini, that were the donkeys that were mistreated. Meanwhile, there were people with cholera, little children, but she, she wasn't paying any attention to that. And the people of her own nationality thought that she was so great that she deserved una lapide. I read it, but I almost went against the wall when I read <laughs> it. was so funny. So living that, you can see they saw too much or even too little. In the sulfur affair, the conditions in which the Caruzzi worked, were unbelievable. And still, I have not really read too much in the foreign press about that, more about monopoly. Now, Michele, country study. Yes, I think that uh, had we followed the country study advice, we would have gone much better. We mustn't forget that our miracle was a miracle because, expect because nobody expected it. But the Germans absorbed five million Germans from the other side several other hundreds of thousands of Germans from other former German territories or uh, people in the Sudetenland and so on, and still had four million foreign workers, nine million people they employed on top of their population, and they had full employment in no time. We had full employment in the north of the country in 1963. Hmm? So it depends who you compare to. Eh? If you want to compare to some people, then you're always il primo. If you want to compare to, to the real prime, then it's a bit of a problem. Also, they had to rebuild a few more houses than we did, because on Germany it was done more properly. The bombing survey, the bombing survey showed that not only Dresden, but the rest were, the factories were not hit too badly, but the people were hit extremely badly. So they had a gigantic job, and they fully used the martial aid. We were the only ones who didn't use it. They, we want to grow again. Why? Because of the death experience after the First World War. The tragedy of the Second World War is that it happened 
20 years after the first, so the people in charge were the same. People had, exper they had experienced the First World War, and they now they and the others really knew that democracy had been killed by foreign debt. And it's not only my poor friend who's also been attacked for having written that democracy had been killed by deflation and foreign debt. Uh, but they now they profoundly believed in it. He even went to the point of, uh, see, we have these debts, we have to pay again. We have to repay them. They had been destroyed after the First World War by the debt, uh, the quantity of foreign debt that had been uh, uh, done, made uh, to fight the war, much more than taxes. So there was a profound distrust of what uh, the people from the other side of the world were offering. Also, they didn't understand the new politics of superpowers. They thought that America was just larger. They didn't think it was the center country. The Gasper, I think, understood that, but uh, these uh, uh, colleagues of ours didn't, who had been, uh, well, I respect them. In fact, I admire them for that, because when they went to talk to the Americans, they didn't feel they didn't go cup in hand, went to the opposite, went the opposite. But that had its limitations in the fact that uh, they did not really use all the resources because they thought they were not gratis. Eh? They thought that there are no cheap lunches, there are no free lunches. In fact, politically, there were no free lunches, but we were done in already, and there was nothing to do about that. Once you accept that, then you can get all the goods from being a slave. But they thought they could still have sovereignty and freedom, and I respect them for that, but the other side of the coin was that the, the speed at which they re-engineered the economy was much lower than it could have been. But, of course, that means uh, that you really are banking on an Italian administration as it did not exist, and. Uh, the respect of the laws that did not exist, and other little problems we are not going into at the moment now. That's all I can say.